Welcome to Unlock Your Soul with yours truly, Anthony Your Soul. This is a space where we scratch beneath the surface to find out what really makes us human. Today, I have a very, very special guest all the way from Kibra, number nine. He's our second guest from Kibra after Jimmy Truth of CISO. But this gentleman, I met him at the EU in Kenya event that happened, wow, literally last year. And... I got to learn about his amazing initiative called Mtasafi. Mtasafi basically means clean hood, clean neighborhood. I want to introduce to you guys a former footballer, but an environmentalist by heart, mind, soul, and body. The one and only Juma. <laughs> <laughs> Mambo. Poor, poor. That's, a, that's a great introduction. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so eh, next time when they introduce you at those high level events, <laughs> tell them, this, you read this? Just do the, what this guy has done. Do exactly this. Juma Mambo VP. What's that? Juma, you know I call you Juma Mtasafi. What is what is actually your real name? Uh, so my real name is uh, Dennis Juma. Dennis Juma. Yeah. Juma is the most common. You know when I used to grow up, it was like, Mr. Juma. <laughs> In every like public primary school book. Mr. Juma had five oranges. <laughs> <laughs> he stood at three. How many more? How many did he left? Was he left with? So thank you for joining us, Juma. Uh, I want us to talk about you know your growing up in Kibra. First of all, the Lomtagani Kibra and how was life growing up in Kibra? Oh, so thank you. Uh, so many me grow Kibra. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kibra is wide. Kibra mm-hmm. has like thirteen villages, mm-hmm. and uh, for me, I grew up in a village. I think it's one of the biggest villages in Kibra. It's called Gatwekera. Gatwekera. Yeah. So Gatwekera, we've always said, is like uh, the capital city of Kibra ah. because that is where politics uh, is all around. Uh-huh. That is where a lot of uh, st- uh, stuff starts spiking up during mm-hmm. election mm-hmm. on a normal day-to-day mm-hmm. lifestyle. There's a lot of, in- of investment in terms of uh, organization, business, and uh, yeah. the growth that is happening there. Yeah. So my parents were, came to Kibra around uh, the early 1990s. Yeah. Then in the late 1990s, yeah. that's where I was born. Yeah. So I've literally spent like all my life in Kibra. So how was how's life growing up in Kibra? How was, how was it? How was Gatwe Kira? Was it like fun? Was it like dangerous? Or is it just like you don't even... It was just as a child, how was it? Uh, so growing up in Gatwe Kira, by that time, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Because uh, we had less people mm-hmm. in the... When I when I was uh, like growing up, when I was one to maybe seven, mm-hmm. uh, there were less people. Then it was kind of bushy in some way because uh, you know, with the forest, yeah. the river cleaner compared to what it is right now. Mm-hmm. So it was a good life. We had yeah. adventure. Yeah, with a lifestyle, it was kind of perfect until maybe after two or seven, everything yeah. transformed. Yeah, yeah. after so, the post-election violence. Yeah. So did did that d- during election time, and of course with all the the madness that comes with elections, did it affect you in any way growing up? Any trauma, you know, in terms of like always being ready to move or like just being worried about what's about to happen next? How has election, how did election interrupt your life in Katwekera? Okay, so, you know, before 207, everything was okay. Then uh, Kibra basically is wide yeah. and uh, it's more diverse. So we've got like every people from different tribes, people mm-hmm. from different cultures, yeah. ethnicity and everything. Yeah. But, you know, ideally most of the guys from Kikuyu tribe on the properties mm-hmm. in terms of housing, the mm-hmm. repairs were done. Mm-hmm. It was kind of easy to manage uh, waste in between the community. Yeah. But you know, after the 207, the post-violence election, yeah. you know, most of the Kikuyus had to move. Yeah. And I know there are uh, most of the houses and the properties were yeah. owned by the people who didn't have them legally, you know. Yeah. So after that, you know, everything will never be the same. Mm. Because uh, during that time, you can imagine at that tender age, you saw the violence. Yeah. I saw how people were being butchered, their fights and everything. Yeah, yeah. Our parents used to like have to find something for you at the end of the day. Yeah. So we used to be locked in the house yeah. all day. And how, many, def- and how many siblings do you have? How many kids are you at home? Uh, five. Five. Yeah. So I mean, also it's not easy because I mean, raising and raising kids in this neighborhood, even if it's just one kid, it's not easy because the opportunities and, and women mostly are the ones affected because they have to feed you yeah. no matter what happens. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a very, you know, when people talk about, we were talking earlier about how when we talk about like difficult upbringing, people think it's a normal, not just having one meal a day. And some people choose to have one meal a day so, you know, they can have a good <laughs> body, so they can diet. But for some of us, some of you people, it's a really difficult upbringing, yeah. not knowing uh, when you're ne- where your next meal is going to come from. So, but then also, I found out today that you are also 
still quite a very good footballer. What position do you play and how did you end up in Upper Hill School? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just okay, so yeah. Yeah. I think uh, with uh okay, mostly if you grow up in an informal settlement, I think the main sport is football. Eh? Yeah. So growing up in Kibra was so good. I was talented in football. I yeah. think it's natural because yeah. my dad also used to play football. Mm. So he really supported me during uh, my growing up yeah. when I was young. Yeah. So I joined a club called Otada. That was my first football club. It was mm. just a local club. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to come together, play football from uh, I started playing when I was around five, six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then I joined an academy in Otada. I went to Ligindogo. Uh-huh. That was like one of the post academies yeah, that we had in Kibera, you know. Ligindogo is like, <laughs> it's got the most Swahili name, but the most bougie, like, you know. Yeah. Everything so, is bougie there. So I got opportunities to play football as well. So I played for some different clubs. Then I had this friend of mine who gave me an opportunity to travel to Norway when mm. I was like 13, you know. Wow. Yeah, so with football, it was like everything for me. But uh, my parents were like, apart from the talent that you have, then there's also education, which might be another opportunity for you in the future. Yeah. So they always pushed for education for me. And uh, when I was playing football, I was spotted. You know, during that time growing up in a, maybe a single square room yeah. with five kids, you know, yeah. the parents are not in a position to take all of you to school. Yeah. Then for my story, it was unfortunate because my sister is an year older than me. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, we sat for the KCP in the same year. So I did better compared to her. But my mm. dad was like, so what do you think? Yeah. Then wow. growing up in that particular time, it's really disadvantageous for girls not to go to school. Yeah. So as a, as a young guy, I was like, okay, I can find a way out, give the opportunity for to my sister to go to school. So you you're one of those people who who sat in the house and you literally have to choose between who should go to school, like who should we take to school, who's yeah. who's gonna get us out of this gutter, and you decided I'm gonna choose my sister. Let her just go. I'm a dude. Me, I'll find a way. Yeah. Okay. So then you get spotted. Yeah, so that's when I was spotted. I spoke to by the, then the, the head teacher, Mr. Orero. Yeah. I got the opportunity to join Formon. Yeah. But unfortunately, there were some issues, you know. You have to go like back to play for some more years. Then yeah. I'm not that guy who is like, I'm not going to spend all this time in high school just because I want to play football. Yeah. So I had the same, same friend who helped me when I was young. So I got a scholarship. Yeah. To support me all through my high school. So I went to Ofafa Jericho High School, mm. still played football. Yeah. I had to level with my education. I found it in, uh, interesting. And yeah. I was like, yeah, let me do, do you, it. Do you feel though, do you sometimes look back and say, if maybe I played, if maybe I took football more seriously, even if I was to like take extra years back in school, I'd probably be a big footballer right now. Yeah. Sure. Do you feel like, man, maybe I should have done this football thing? Because I, I understand our obsession with education. I understand yeah. that education can change your life but also football can change your life when i was in school i remember all, when i was in upper hill i remember all H was in upper hill man never used to see that guy in school in class <laughs> <laughs> there was a football i was never saw him in yeah. class mr Olero. <laughs> would you like to answer that question i never saw him in um in school in class but i know he was playing for upper hill and then you reached a point where upper hill became a very 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 sporty school and this is actually thanks to mr Olero. yeah who, by the way, Mr. Rero is like, you, be, you he's now the MP for Kibra. Yes. Let me tell you guys, Mr. Rero is a very cool person. May I don't know about other people's experience, but to me, he was a very cool person. I mean him, he was a, he was literally like the type of person who will just support boys. You know, like just let these boys be, support them, let them play football, let them play rugby, do whatever you can to support them. But I mean, here you are, you're out of, you've left high school, uh, you know, you're still in Kibra. How do you then end up having oh, this passion for, uh, for, for, for the environment? What, what sparks the green in you? Yeah, so like I've said, growing up in Kibra, it was uh, more green yeah. and uh, nice. Yeah. So when I started understanding myself when I was like in Form 2, Form 3, I realized that uh, the adventure that we used to have in Kibra is no longer there. Yeah. We had caves, they're still yeah. there, but uh, they are dirtier. The river now was more dirtier. Mm. People were dumping in the river. Yeah. Along the railway tracks, they, yeah. it was dirtier. So people yeah. like took it normal to just dump anywhere. And now, in, unfortunately, because we don't have like official dump sites, people started like just coming up with landfills. Mm-hmm. And everywhere you were walking before we had like the tarmac road, thanks to the NMS, yeah. it has really changed a lot. Before yeah. it was chaotic. Yeah. So cars cannot come in in terms of emergency. Yeah. There's waste all over. There's yeah. outbreak of cholera that yeah. was in uh, 2017, 2018. Mm-hmm. So I was like, what is happening? What is transforming that we didn't have before? Because ideally, the youth have been doing garbage collection door to door. 
So I was like, uh, this one is not enough. Yeah. And uh, since I'm I'm a guy who love a clean environment, even mm. in my place, I just try to make it much better. Yeah. When I like add the waste from home, I used to sort it like yeah. from the just the basic knowledge that I had. So I was yeah. like, I need to get more information to learn and see what I can start doing in my own village yeah. so that I can spike the other youth. And that's where I found myself now trying to involve myself in more of matches for the environment, mm -hmm. trying to understand the diversity of our climate, the diversity of uh, the globe itself, the earth, the water, everything. And uh, for, like I just found myself loving what I'm doing yeah. and I wanted to do more. And then you started the initiative called Mtasafi. Yeah. Uh, tell us, I mean, Mtasafi means clean neighborhood, clean hood, clean environment. So, so how how is it? You know, starting this uh, sort of movement and 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 give us paint for us a picture. We're gonna insert pictures and videos for you guys to sort of see the work at hand. You know, on the ground. But how does that look like? Like. In the morning when you wake up, what does it mean when you you know, have to make calls or WhatsApp or whatever? People decide to just come and dump. You know, you know how they dump at night? Yeah. They dump somewhere so they can someone else can deal with it. How does that look like? What do you do to, to make sure that your mta is actually safi? Uh, so funny enough, I'll say most of the people when they hear the word mta safi, everything that comes to their mind is the, the environmental stuff, you know, the, yeah. the dirty neighborhood mm -hmm. and the other perspective of mm -hmm. it. But uh, coming up with Mta Safi, my idea was different. You know, Kibera has been painted as a bad place by yeah. most of the people yeah. from what you read from the social media when yeah. the people come or they ask you. Yeah. So I also did tours when I cleared my high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I used to get a lot of difficult questions from people who came to visit. Yeah. And uh, the Mta Safi actually was trying to paint a different mindset of the community. That is what, what I envisioned. Yeah. And uh, when I brought the youth together, I was like, what can we do? Mm -hmm environmentally mm -hmm. so that uh, at the end of the day we can change the narrative of how people have been perceive, yeah. perceiving the community because yeah. after two, 2007 to around 2013 Kibera really had insecurities yeah now you know after post-violence election everyone is trying to recover yeah. less job opportunities from the government yeah and at the end of the day you need to find something so yeah. there are some places in Kibera which were not safe for you to access you know if you're an outsider. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to change the, the, the painting that we are having over Kibera. And that's why I came up with Mta Safi, a clean mindset, a clean neighborhood, mm. free from whatever so people have been perceiving. It's the mental health, it's, it's the knowledge and understanding that you get. So it's clean. Yeah. Everything is clean. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, so ideally, I was like, uh, in the, in the informal statement, most of the people tend to do something because it's a norm. Yeah. And the only way you can change the perspective is by giving them information. Yeah. And the only way you get the information is uh, through just doing sensitization. Yeah. You need to engage the community. You know, unlike maybe in different places, yeah. informal settlement people live together. There's a communal like uh, stuff in the community. Mm. So what you need to do is to ensure that people understand the thesis of what you're trying to come up with. Yeah. And that's why I was like, okay, we need to start from the simplest information or truth that we can use for these people to understand. Yeah. Why do we have people littering everywhere? Exactly. Why do we have uh, a problem in terms of uh, people paying out for the garbage that come from the houses? Why are people dumping in the rivers and yeah. the same, same people are living? Yeah, why is it so easy to just wake up, take all your dirty stuff in the house and throw it in the river like you don't like <laughs> and you don't feel anything. Yeah. Yeah. So for me it was it wasn't normal. And that's why I was like, okay, we need to do something. So I came up with the idea of talking to the community to try to get uh, to understand what they think about the initiative. And they were like, first of all, we do not understand how we can dump our waste. Yeah. Then people like try to throw it where the landfills are, yeah. the yeah. rivers are, yeah. because there are people who live like close to the river. Yeah. And unfortunately, we had people even being losing their lives yeah, because so when it's flooding yeah. and everything, you know. Yeah. So I realized that uh, there's less info information about uh, waste management and that's why i wanted like to make it easier for people to syncretize this thing yeah. uh, in the community about yeah. waste environment yeah. how it affects them how it can be beneficial to them how it's circular economical yeah. how it can be sustainable so it is more of a trying to bring it to their level yeah and that's why we came up with mtasafi so it was more of preaching the message for them to understand mm -hmm. why is this environment yeah. important to you yeah how can it be beneficial to the youth and how can it be sustainable? So there's a lot of why. Why yeah. a lot of why are we doing X? Why do we do X? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's that's it's it's very commendable how you've literally taken up the job of certain organizations or uh, governments to do what they should be doing. But also, I mean, I know that would also mean a really huge, uh, 
you know, effect on your po- in your pocket. Yeah. So I can imagine the number of times that you have to go back to your pocket to be able to have some of these programs or initiatives actually, you know, go all the way to fruition. What does that mean in terms of challenges that you face for you to be able to even just sensitize the community? What does that mean to your pocket? What does that mean to your mental health, emotional, psychologically, spending time away from your family? What does that mean for you? Okay, if I talk about uh, the mental side of it, yeah. I think growing up uh, in an informal settlement, it teaches you how to be like, uh, you know, there's yeah. that aspect that you grew up deal with, with like deal with it, you know. Yeah. Then uh, we grew up with that narrative that if you're a man, you need to do it like extra, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I think it has also played a role in uh, helping us because most of the youth in the informal settlement, as well as any other human being, yeah. they go through depression, but they yeah. do not realize this is depression yeah. because there are some things that you cannot control. Yeah. But uh, the way the community or your environment is, it doesn't favor you to speak it out. Mm. People will say you as a lame guy. Yeah. People will be like, hey, wait a minute. Also, also you know? immediately they just consider you a man mental illness, yeah, mental case. Yeah. And my mental case in Kenya, what they mean is that you are psychotic, mm-hmm. you need to be in a hospital and change to the bed. That So if you, unless that's the way you are, move on with your life. And they'll even make joke of it. They say they'll take you to Madari or yeah. Ungambili. You know? Yeah, wow. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, there's this joke. So, so guys, there's this joke. Um, so Madare is like the, the referral mental institution in Kenya. And there's always this joke even growing up. They'd say like every Friday, over the weekend, I yeah. think, <laughs> every Friday, or oh yeah, well, Friday, that they'd say that a normal Kenyan, would, normal civilian would conduct a, a, what is the word, a civilian arrest, you know? Yeah. And literally take somebody who they consider to be mentally ill to the referral hospital and get two packets of maize flour. And it was a joke. So if you even say like you have a problem mentally, they'll say, ah, you know now you can make me... <laughs> You can make me two two packets of maize flour. So stop saying things like those. I mean, it sounds funny, but it is so wrong. It's crazy, you know. It's crazy. It's literally crazy. <laughs> literally crazy, for lack of a better word. But also from a financial point of view, I know it it affects you. It's yeah. it's it's not easy. The, 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 you know, you have to go to your pocket. So how do you how do you how do you survive? How do you sustain Mjasafi? Uh, so for me, uh, when I came out of high school, I really wanted to join like campus. So I had a friend of mine. Uh, he's from Dubai. Yeah. So he's an advocate and he was like trying to take me through the basic concepts of law. That's what that's uh-huh. where my interest is. Mm. So I really grew the interest of understanding the constitution, how things are run, the law stuff, you know. I wanted to like venture into law. Because also apart from that, you know, people have a lot of uh, problems in the community yeah. in terms of uh, social justice because yeah. they do not understand who to run to. Yeah. So with that one, it's easier for me to see how I can get small support in the programs that we are doing. Because financially, it's a challenge if you have to get money from your pocket. Yeah. You're not earning enough. You have your yeah. own family. Yeah. Then uh, in the community, like Kibra, if you reach to a certain age, like when I was 16, 17, I would already find a place for myself. Yeah. Because in this single room, I cannot spend the same time with my family, yeah. with my sisters, my Privacy, siblings, uh, you know, I mean, it's so... It takes it, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, uh, like, I remember the first house that I moved to, I used to pay, like, 400. Yeah. So I have to, like, go to different it places. It was a struggle. It's a struggle. 400 is, like, $3. It was a struggle. Yeah. Yeah, because at that particular time, you're still in high school. Then at some point, you even have to go to school, do an extra thing at school, maybe to see how you can get money even to support the family at home. Mm. So these are some of the things that you go through, but uh, they make you who you are. Yeah. So financially, it's just more of saving and bringing the friends together who understood the essence of what you're doing. And you're yeah. like, uh, if you can save a certain amount of money as a group, then we can come up with a program. I really uh, focused on more of empowerment because I was trying to tell these guys, if these people understand what you're doing, then it's easier for us to convince other people to support us. Exactly. So it took a lot of sacrifice of uh, what do you have? If I have a hundred and the other person have a hundred, how can we come up with a program of maybe twice in a month to bring the community have a public conversation with the yeah. community to understand what they do? In the community, need to get them something like just a refreshment, yeah. appreciate their time for being there. Then yeah. that's how we did it, and now we start inviting more networks of friends that you have, like a the friend that I had from Dubai, yeah. trying to see the people that I played football with and they understand what you're doing, coming up with tournaments, you know. So it's more of a straining yourself, mm-hmm. trying to see what you have. At the end of the day, you need to survive for yourself. Yeah. And you also need to make sure that this thing moves, you know. And it's also the lesson in life. And I, and I love that you're having that conversation around, you know, sometimes you have to suffer yourself as a Nigerian. Say you have to struggle a bit at the beginning just so that everything that you're doing can make sense yeah. later for a lot of people. So you, you not only just have to 
uh, and what you're doing is deleg- you're delegating passion which is which is something very rare is you telling people that I have the formula I know what we need to do but also I need you guys to understand and put it into practice so you can actually be able to achieve these things and, and also a lesson I'm learning from you is that you can't do it on your own yeah it's not possible but also in the same breath government has let you down because I feel that in fact I even wrote in my notes that your organization should not exist because the government should be doing so much that you for example should come in as a consultant in terms of how do you rally the crowds how do you rally, rally people in kibra what language do we speak so they can understand what the government is trying to do you should be probably working for the government and not, not that it's a bad thing but like if their programs worked yeah. or if they had a vision you would be the guy on the ground ensuring that it's actually implemented but governments i don't know whether they are dissociated with what's happened on the ground I don't know if it's a it's a lack of empathy or just apathy towards its people. What more do you think the government should be doing from the head of state to the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Health, to the Ministry of Lands, Ministry of Planning? There is so much involved that they are literally, for lack of a better word, they are doing zilch, nada, zero. They're doing nothing about it. What what policies or what what would you suggest or what would you advise the government to do to make it easier for organizations like Mtasafi to exist okay so according to my knowledge on the the strat- structures of the government yeah. i've always seen the government as this guy who's well groomed yeah so eloquent in good in, in good uh, terms in terms of uh, maybe policies yeah kenya is one of the best policy making countries in the entire world yeah but now we have the gap in implementation mm. because you see if you give someone an opportunity to do something with mm-hmm. zero information yeah then it becomes very difficult for the exact project to yeah. be implemented yeah and this is where the gap has been the people who are maybe given the opportunity or the mandate to take care of whatever is happening in the environmental sector mm-hmm. they either have zero or yeah. next to none yeah. information about how the environment is yes. what the circular zone entails mm. who are the primary actors with numbers who are working on the ground yes. so i think the government need to work more on our implementation yeah. because that's where they failed us yeah. if they could be implementing whatever we are doing right now then it'd yeah. be easier for us to be consultants it, it's 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 coming off like the government and not what you're saying but what I, what has been happening the government has seen another money making scheme yeah and even and even some private institutions where they feel like ah environment is a new place to make money I mean look at the number of delegates they send out to to <laughs> to environmental very high level forums and conventions and conferences look at the people who even when we host those kind of um events like in Africa uh, climate summit look at the people who go to represent you have first hand have dealt with going to an event where you meet representatives from Nai- from Nai- from Kibra your hood who are there to represent the hood in terms of environment and people who are doing stuff you know in the hood to help alleviate some of these problems and you realize these guys do not come from kibra so it tells you people have realized ah there's a place here to make up a dm ah there's a place here to make make my friends and my cronies travel mm. you know to give out this political you know gifts and whatever does it bother you does it pain you seeing that people are now looking at environment as another cash cow literally yeah, it's so painful because one I'll say growing up in Kibra we still have the gap in terms of uh, even organizations or uh, companies investing uh, in environmental stuff mm-hmm. because uh, when I grew up in Kibra I, see, I saw like uh, some of the biggest organizations were just focusing on uh, education yeah. well-being and all that stuff but at the end of the day everything that we do is useless without uh, an environment mm-hmm. that is conducive mm-hmm. because the environment depicts who you become in the next maybe or in yeah, the future yeah. because if these kids cannot even just uh, be in a position to escape such simple st- stuff like uh, a healthy environment yeah then w- what are you trying to do yeah. at the end of the day what's the point of what's it the, all you know yeah so i also feel it's like uh, shameful yeah for people who, like uh, try to see this as an, as an opportunity because yeah. at the end of the day people are like i'm trying to do something to survive yeah but you know these are some of the things that you carry yeah. and they go to affect you in the future yeah but how, you survive for how long that is the point <laughs> that, that, that's the problem yeah because uh, like you've just mentioned it's so it's so unfortunate that you meet someone representing kibra 
who've never even been to Kibra, they don't yeah. even understand the, the yeah. whatever is happening in Kibra. Yeah. But the point is not a uh, competition. The point is what solutions are we getting? Mm. And I've always told anyone that I meet, it's very simple for us to do this because it's local solution to local problems. Yeah. I grew up in this place. I see where the problems are. I'm doing something toward getting a solution. I'm empowering other people yeah. because it's not uh, something that I'm doing to gain the heroism. Exactly. I'm trying to impact people to understand yeah. that this thing can be sustainable for them. This yes. thing can be more impactful. Yes. But at the end of the day, there are some people who will always take advantage. That happens ever since yeah. the Asian trauma yeah. and everything. Yeah. But at the end of the day, is uh, what do we do as individuals exactly. on the ground to yeah. see that we can impact people and change the narrative that is there. Yeah. So, th wow, that, that is, uh, that's, that's really nice. So now let's also, let's look at Kibra now in its entirety and I, it's it's interesting because when people think about Kibra I mean it's it's uh, known as probably Africa's largest you know uh, slum but also you know for me it's a gold mine of sorts because I mean where people for the longest time are not given opportunities when they decide to rise up they can really do people like you who are able to do so much uh, with with very resources in terms of the environment in terms of water in terms of hygiene when you look at Kibra, what are some of the solutions that you think Kibra requires? Let's say, let's talk about like a one-year plan from today. And I'm looking at you now as the mayor of Kibra. Yeah. And you're standing in front at Gatwekera, the whole of Kibra is listening to you that day, the whole of Kibra is listening to you, and you want to give us a solution as to how we can deal with the environment. What are some of you, what is your five-point plan on how you can fix environmental issues um, in Kibra? Okay, uh, if I talk about the first thing, yeah. I'll talk about empowerment. Mm -hmm. That is the first important thing. Mm -hmm. Because if we have empowered people, mm -hmm. then they understand what you're trying to do. Because most of the organization have come up with uh, ideas. Kibera has a lot of water underground. Mm -hmm. And our organizations like even Shovgo, they're trying to come up with boreholes. Mtasaf itself, we've dug a borehole providing water to the community members. Yes. But you see, if you come with uh, your own uh, structure, yeah. then how is the water going to be useful to the people who need it? Yeah. So the first thing is empowerment. The second thing that I'll talk about is... Uh, empowerment I'm, even through knowledge. Knowledge and also the pockets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. The second thing I'll talk about is uh, financial support mm -hmm. and resources. Yeah, because there's a lot of great idea. Yeah. Not only Mtasafi, a lot of youth have a lot of ideas, but these guys are not financially resourceful to do whatever they love to do. Yeah. It's very difficult for you to know or understand who is the best person that I can share the idea to without having the fear of losing the idea or maybe not getting the support, mm. you know? Mm. Then uh, the other thing I'll talk about is, uh, the important thing is uh, the implementation. Yes. Because uh, we talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah. So many said, nothing is done. So we keep on going through the same, same circular stuff, you know? So implementation is a big issue, a big problem. It's a very big problem. Because uh, we can have best ideas, we can talk about them. We have very, very nice people talking in the parliament, trying to debate about good stuff, but yeah. how much is implemented? Yeah. How many people understand that this thing is meant for them? Yeah. What about the city council when they decide to go and clean the, you know, the, the streets? Are they, are they doing, is anyone following up on what they're supposed to be doing? What about Nairobi city water? When we talk about water leakages, you know, what about the environment, uh, environment ministry? What talk about clean up days or mm, cleaning up? Mm. So that implementation is an issue. What about planning? Yeah. Are they, you know, arresting, let's say these big landlords who say they can build over a river and do heck all that they want to this. What about even issues like, let's say, you know, fire department, someone decides they're going to obstruct the road or where the, the fire department should get their water because someone who is in power, who's powerful, who's a landlord and no one's going to touch them. So this, because of someone who, some, someone who grew up in the, in, in the ghetto, you do have a huge point here. And, the, and, the, and, and, and what I'm hearing for me is that you're saying the biggest issue here is that Anto, I have so many ideas. We have so many ideas in Kibra. We are an idea gold mine. But the problem is implementing these ideas is our biggest problem. Let's, let's uh, head on to Kenya's tree planting day. We, I don't know how much we spent, 150 million, I don't know how much we spent during the Kenya tree planting day. Is it, is it, do you think it's gonna work? Is it viable? Is it something commendable? Do you think the president is doing enough? As far as, I mean, it's come off like he's a very big environmentalist. Uh, is, is it enough? Is there any foul play? in terms of uh, uh, participation on the ground? Did it happen and you felt, you know, maybe the events that happened, for example, to do the environment and you feel left out a lot of times or you feel like, okay, I mean, I can't be everywhere, but 
how do they how do they miss me for this event happening uh, are these initiatives by the president by the presidency are, are they worthwhile okay yeah so i'll say first of all that's a very good idea yeah and uh, like i've always said that uh, we are very good at coming up with ideas we're very good at coming up with policies and so kenya set aside 500 billion yeah to plant 5 billion trees yeah by 2032 yeah Right now as we're standing our forest uh, percentage is at 12 yeah. we are aiming at 25 wow so you see this is uh, unrealistic by that period of time yes because that means that uh, we have to work on a uh, uh, 50 billion a year yeah. for us to plant at least 1 billion trees every exactly. year exactly because they'll die they'll i mean they have to be watered and remember they've been they're, you're planting them like let's say right now we decide to go all the way to kino yeah so we plant them in kino and then we have to go back home so who's supposed to take care of them So I think the aspect of uh, environment is uh, trying to understand uh, sustainability. Yeah. There's tree planting and tree growing. Mm. You know, if you are an, an environmentalist, I know my friend Boya will align with this. Yeah. If you're an environmentalist, you grow a tree, do not plant it. Mm. Planting a tree everyone can do it. We can do it right now. Yeah, we just plant we a tree on. then we yeah. move. But growing a tree is walking with the trees like your kid. But it doesn't even make no sense because at the end of the day, why would you plant a billion trees and at the same time people are given the opportunity to cut down the trees? You see, this is why I always insist on having the youth in some of these forums because I feel like that if someone like Ruto and his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, you know, his idea, <laughs> idea, whatever, uh, crew, thought of, you know, yeah, let's have a few young people who are actually, like you said, people who are doing stuff in, on the ground let's have them here you boya the like of again you know, alfonso all those guys let's sit down and let's actually hear what these guys have to say imagine you sitting in a room full of phd holders and saying where are we calling tree planting let's call it tree growing yeah it comes with more responsibility but you know why nobody like, like you or your age was in that room so nobody would have seen that vacuum okay so tree growing let's change to tree growing there's he has he has many other initiatives including you know carbon uh, credit including you know financing uh, governments basically because of climate change and the fact that we are not to blame for climate change but we are the worst hit when it comes to effects of climate change when you listen and when you hear to all these plans that he has Again, are they worthwhile? Do they need reconstructing? Do they need more participation? Or have you reached a point where you just say, you know what? Stew yourself, fry yourself in your own uh, uh, oil. I am just tired of trying to make these guys understand. How, how, where, at what, where are you? Okay, I'll say uh, I'll never get tired. Yeah. Because... Uh, You see for the climate change people still do not understand what climate change is a bigger percentage of people in the, in the maybe in the country so it's more of uh, trying to talk to these people to understand what is it and this thing doesn't happen the same in all the regions yeah the the, the heat at uh, maybe in kibra will not be the same in turkana mm. and people need to understand this yeah. because these are things that have been happening there yeah. but now it's just becoming extreme yeah i think there's a good structure to do this but again who are you consulting yeah. because if you say that the youth are the future of tomorrow yeah. and you put us away from understanding oh the ideas God, i hit that statement it, it, i've grown up all my life here in i hate it so much <laughs> so, you guys now i am past getting a, t- a tender as a youth <laughs> and i'm still hearing that nonsense of the youth as moving on swiftly so if these people do not understand yeah. what is going to happen in the next two or three months yeah. that's how i see it as a long term goal yeah. two three months yeah. if you do not engage me right now as a youth yeah. then i le- i lose the interest These guys are not going to be young in the next 10 years. Yeah. The president will not have the same energy he has right now in the next 10 years. Yeah. The same people in the cabinet. Yeah. So this means that we're just trying to bring a Kenya that is going to be more useless compared to whatever we are right now because mm. right now the tendency is where the youth are trying to give up. How many people are strong enough to hold and say we're going to fight for this country? Yeah. How many people are, are strong enough to hold and say hey let's fight for the environment yeah. because we understand the side effects of the climate change. Yeah. So it, it takes more of a opportunities not just opportunities to showcase on our media and yeah. say hey we are some one two three other people yeah. who are doing this yeah. stuff but empower these people to elevate is more is not more of a change it's more of a transition and so mm. a transition is you saw me today in this particular point tomorrow this is the number 
of uh, impact that I have that can be weighed and there's a data to show that. Yeah. I think that's where we are failing. I love that. Yeah. It's more of a transition. As we transition to the end of our conversation, um, let's talk about, lastly, let's talk about um, COP28 and uh, and all the shenanigans that come with COP28. <laughs> because I feel there's, there's very little in con- conversation around environment, but more around the drama that happens around... And it's only in Kenya, where you're like, where you're like 700, 700 million people from this country <laughs> ended up. By the way, 700 people going to a conference means that it's like a, it's like a high school. That's like a school. Yeah. It's like everyone for a week live in school and going to pitch camp, pitch tent in another school. And there's nobody in that school, including the teachers. That's what it means by 700 people. It means you can walk around and ask, eh, I've not seen uh, Juma of late. Ah, Juma is in Dubai. <laughs> then I walk around and say, where is Sheila? Ah, even her, she's in Dubai. That's how COP28, you know, it really came up for me. Like, there's so much drama around the expenditure, around the money involved with COP, rather than actually the ideas. And there are so many people who are there. There's the likes of Boya, the likes of Alphonse. There's, there's a lady, why has her name left me? We were with her at the EU event. Mm-hmm. Why has the name gone? What? Wazuti, yeah, oh, oh my god, yeah, Wazuti. <laughs> so, you know, people who are doing such great stuff, but all that is always taken away from the shenanigans that comes with government being involved in stuff. So, let's talk about those sort of conferences. Do those conferences mean anything in terms of financing a more developing worlds, in terms of ideas, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of resources? Do they mean anything to, the, uh, to you as an environmentalist? Or, or is it another chance for guys to, you know, prop up themselves? Okay, I'll say, uh, honestly, it's an opportunity for people to have a road trip. Yeah. To go to <laughs> Dubai. <laughs> Boya, are you, are you here? Mm, he's gonna come here. The next guest is a guy called Mbaya, who even he was on a road trip. But okay. I will find out if he was really on a road trip. No, you can't. Don't. <laughs> he's like, no, it's not. I didn't go on a road trip. <laughs> so, uh-huh, it's a chance for guys to go on a road trip. I think, I think Mbaya will understand what I'm saying. Uh-huh. From the aspect of the people who are supported to go. Yeah. Maybe if we're talking about 700 people supported by the government to go to COP28. Yeah. And, uh, Ideally, from what I heard from her. Hi, Ego. <laughs> <laughs> That's my friend. It's called Ego. Hi, Ego. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh-huh. ideally, from what we had uh, initially from the plan of Sultan Al- Al-Jaber, yes. the, the main uh, aspects that were targeted for COP28 this time, I think, was uh, on fossil fuels and uh, stuff to do with finances, you know. Yeah. But... Uh, I've always asked myself, we've always have a lot of, na- the biggest number of delegates going to these activities, anything related to environment, summits representing the government. Yeah. But where are these people after yeah. this event? What yeah. reports do we get back? Yeah. You know, the point is, I know people like Mboyago, they get networks which are trying to empower the partnership for the primary actors and the local youth who are doing something on environment. But the number of bigger people went for the road trips, people were to go far and just see how luxurious Dubai looks like. Yeah. What reports do they have for us? Yeah. What can be talked about? And can about? they be made public, these reports? Because you, you go and you present a whole office or a whole organization or institution, make that report public. So we know you didn't go there and came back with a two-page report. Yeah. Every single day, like a two-day report times six. So 12-page report to understand which conferences did you go to, which breakout sessions were you a part of, what did you learn, what implementation ideas do you have, not just those representation at COP, and then what? You know? It's very sad. I, I, you know, we can beat this... Uh, we can beat this conversation until the end of times, but um, <laughs> as, we, as we end this conversation... What is your plan from Tasafi and the Pan-African perspective, and 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 what are your plans? What do you what do you what do you want to do? How does your how does your next two three years look like? We're 1924. How does 26 look like for you? The next COP. How how does Tasafi look like for you? Do you intend to have Tasafi move into Mukuru, into Mazare? What are the big ideas you have for yourself? Uh, so I'll say like for now. Mtasaf, we've tried uh, to do the best we can to achieve whatever we are doing. We're working through 21 youth. So the biggest goal that I've seen uh, with Mtasaf, the vision that I have is uh, trying to empower the youth 
for circular economy. Yeah. Because right now we are working on waste management. I've been working on a thesis to understand different markets for different types of waste. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, before even we go to the next three, two or three years, yeah. maybe we talk about the next six months plan, okay. which is trying to come up with a green space. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately in Kibra, we do not have a green space. We do not have buyback centers. Yeah. So if we can have such buyback center, that is job opportunities to at least more than 50 youth. Because uh, a lot of the youth are working on a daily basis of waste management, picking up this garbage and everything. But uh, what do they get in return? Because we still have middlemen. Yeah. So the main motive of um, Tasafi for me is to get rid of these middlemen so that we bring the market closer to this mm, youth mm. to understand that the waste that you are having, either it's organic, plastic, paper waste, electronic, all type of waste have their markets, which we already do have right now. Yeah. So by coming up with a buyback center and a green space, then it's easier for them to come and learn more ideas, try to implement them. And you see, for me, Anto, I've always not seen Tasafi as having another branch in Mukuru. Yeah. We have groups doing such I stuff. I mean, Mukuru in is France right now. Can't the president? Europe. <laughs> Mukuru is in Europe. <laughs> Mukuru, guys, is another slum, so you can Google it. M-U-K-U-R-U. <laughs> but the president said that it's, it's like a France. It's Marseille. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to... We can't include Mukuru in this conversation again. So, yeah, you're saying, you know, it's not about... So it's, 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 it's not an organization to like branch out and do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You want to maintain your center. Maintain mm -hmm. the center. Yeah. Work with people, partner with people who are doing the same thing that you're doing. Empower them in their in, yeah. in their place yeah. to do the same thing. Yeah. It's just a matter of passing on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sharing the knowledge. Exactly. I don't, I don't see the essence of us having branches all over Kenya, mm -hmm. which are not impactful. Mm -hmm. But we already have people like Mutasafi who are trying to do something in their communities. Yeah. So the idea is to work with them in the next three or five years. Mm -hmm making it simple for us to understand where do we get these resources, where do we get the finances, how do we use them in an easier way. Mm. Because you see, most of the grants or maybe the finances come with a lot of uh, difficulties in terms of uh, regulations exactly. and uh, monitoring and evaluation. So it becomes very impossible or next to impossible for people who've never had such information mm. on management mm. to, to know how to run the programs. Yeah. At the end of the day, they're doing the most job but they're not given the grant simply because they do not have the class knowledge exactly. of running this stuff. Yeah. So I think even it's just applying for the grants and uh, for the funds and even sort of accounting for that becomes a huge problem which stops them from gaining other op opportunities. Because I mean also, and, and I remember we had the conversation during the EU event, EU in Kenya event that we had, uh, the monitoring and evaluation bit of it yeah. is stopping a lot of these people from, from, from getting grants because what the organizations are more concerned about is what did you do with the money within six months, within eight months, account for us. Well, sometimes, think about it this way. If let's say you had to pay for casual laborers to let's say build a mini dam in Kibra. How do you begin to have these guys invoice you? <laughs> How can they invoice you for, let's say, a thousand shillings, ten dollars a day worth of work, so you can then send this money, so send these invoices back to your granta? How... Uh, how do you start? <laughs> so you look like you're stealing their money, but in, in, in essential, in effect, on the ground, things are so different that giving somebody a grant with so many caveats, it's not really giving them a grant. Mm -hmm. It's more of like another, it's choose between a carrot and a stick. What do you want to give me? Are you giving me a stick to beat me or do you want to give me a carrot? Which one do you want? So I completely get you. As, so, I, I mean, for anybody who wants to be in touch with you, who'd like you to go to schools, to speak to young kids, to, you know, probably start, you know, help, help start you know, clubs for young kids, maybe it's their culture club, environment club, uh, in, in, in primary schools, in high schools, in uni. Maybe somebody wants you to have, to have you at a conference to speak and, and you know, and bring your insight or even at a, at a panel, you know, at a, you know, a creative, uh, you know, panel. So you can speak and you can have these conversations. How can they reach you? Do you want to leave your number? Do you want to leave your social media handles so they can just you know, hear you out and be like, I want to talk to that guy. I want to talk to Juma of Mtasafi. How they, can they, even your email, how can they reach you? Okay, so we have our social media pages uh, for Mtasafi Initiative that yeah. is uh, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, you can reach out from there. I also the, have... The, uh, yeah. the, the, the handles are? Yes. The handles? Mta, Mtasafi Initiative. So it's M T W A S A F I S A F I. Mtasafi yeah. Initiative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, email number. Yeah. So our email is uh, mtasafi2018 yeah. at mm -hmm. gmail.com. Mm -hmm. uh, then I also have my phone number that's active. So yeah. that's uh, plus 254702691592. So plus 
zero two. Uh huh. Six nine one. Six nine one. Five nine two. Five nine two. Yeah. So, the girls who have a crush on you, they should also like. <laughs> 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 there probably be some girls be like, ah, let me. It's only for the for environment business. cause. <laughs> so someone may be like, some girls may be like, ah. <laughs> I can't believe I'm about to say this. <laughs> Some girls will be like, I have a bush. I want him to clear the bush. I'm not clearing <laughs> the private bush. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. Anyway, it is what it is. Do you keep promises? I do. Where are my shoes? <laughs> That's all I, I'm going to say. So girls, don't even, don't even inbox him. Because he's not... He does not keep promises. This guy, the first time I met him, they were not even these shoes. They were shoes like these ones. What did these shoes know? They were shoes. Ebu come and go to his shoe game. <laughs> I saw this guy with shoes like this at an EU in Kenya event that he was a part of and he was speaking to the EU, um, EU ambassador. And this dude, I saw the shoes and I was like, I want shoes like those. Since September of last year, I am still waiting. Utter disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> you know the problem with the shoes is like they're not from the shop. Ah, please. They are Mutumba shoes, so I need to like. Yeah, whatever, man. Get them. I'll get I them for I you. I don't want to hear. <laughs> you, second, it's so difficult for you to get me secondhand shoes. Like, it's so difficult. I'm disappointed <laughs> in you, but I'm very proud of what you do. When I met you, we immediately clicked, and I knew that you're doing great stuff. And I decided from your episode, I'm gonna have a book here called The Pocket Roomy. S- certain quotes that I read from you know this prophet called Rumi. And I have one for you today. The one that I have for you today is the soul garden. Just as the heart becomes carefree in a place of green growing plants, goodwill and kindness are born when our souls enter happiness. So keep doing good. Keep being kind. And I I hope that will allow your soul to enter into happiness. Thank you for unlocking your soul with me and with all of us. And I hope that you keep unlocking Mtasafi, man. That's what's up. Hiya. Thank you. Make sure you follow us on all our social media handles at Instagram at Unlock Your Soul Podcast and on TikTok at Unlock Your Soul Podcast. Follow, like, comment, share, subscribe, hit that notification button. And thank you for so far we have 1490, I think 1500 uh, subscribers on YouTube and we are growing. So thank you for all the love that you're showing us on our YouTube Keep it locked and keep unlocking your soul. Ah. Thank you for choosing Unlock Your Soul podcast, where it helps you to grow and, of course, unlock your soul. I hope you learned something new, something bright, something great today, and that you can also share this podcast with each and every single person that you know. All you got to do is review, like, and share this podcast on your favorite social media platform. Also, make sure you check us out on YouTube at Unlock Your Soul Podcast, on Instagram at Unlock Your Soul Pod, and on TikTok at Unlock Your Soul Podcast. It's time 